Well, I want to welcome you on Pentecost Sunday. That's what today is. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Um, at this time, uh, we're, well, are we going to do Sunday school, hon? At this time, the children can go downstairs to Sunday school with Wendy. And uh, we're, we've got lots of going on, but I just, first of all, I want to share with you a little bit about why Pentecost Sunday is so significant, okay? In, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus was talking to the faithful 11, Judas was not there when he said this. In verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, I will pray that the Father will send you another comforter, that he will abide with you forever. It is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, for it neither knows him, but you know him, for he is with you and shall be in you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was with the believer. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is in the believer. And I want to read to you what Jesus did. Um, I'm going to hit Acts 1 real quick and Acts 2. I'm just going to read it. It says in Acts 1, 1, it says, The former treaties I have made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandment unto the apostles to whom he had chosen, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which he saith, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when therefore they came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put forth in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And then chapter 2 of Acts. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation, under heaven. And when this noise abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because they heard every man speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not these all speak Galileans? And how hear we now every man in our own tongue, wherein we are born? Parthians, Medes, Emelites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, about Serene, and strangers from Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, and they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? Today is the celebration of the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. The ecclesia, the called out ones. Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is poured out on you. If you remember, all through his ministry, he talked about baptizing his disciples with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the purpose of the day of Pentecost was to empower the church to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And today, we have missionaries who are going to share with us how God is using them in Africa, part of the uttermost part of the earth, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I'm here to tell you, my friends, that this Jesus thing, this church thing, cannot survive without the Holy Spirit. And I remind you of what Zechariah the prophet said when he, told, when he was exhorting Joshua and Zerubbabel to do the work of God. 
He said to them, it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. I stand here today preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ by the power of God's spirit. You are saved and sit here in this place because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the church would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And we recognize our utter dependence upon him. And that's why we need to sing songs, Spirit, come upon me. Because you know what? This was the first Pentecost. This was the Jewish Pentecost. Because later on, Peter was led by the Holy Spirit to go to the Gentiles. And they also were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? They spoke with tongues. And they glorified the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe that makes some of you a little uncomfortable, but I'm here to tell you, the gifts of the Spirit are for today and for you. And I don't see any scripture that says that they're done and over with. And I believe that those who teach such things are an heir to God's word because the gifts of the Spirit are for today. You can speak in tongues. You can lay your hands on the sick. You can have supernatural faith. You can have visions, signs, and wonders come to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have prophetic utterances be, be spoken to you and through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today we invite uh, Luann to come up and eventually Bob to come up and share with us on how the Holy Spirit is moving in Africa through their ministry. We've done this song before here. I don't know. Some of you weren't here then at that time. But <clears throat> this is a Swahili song that it just says, where Jesus is, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Where Jesus is, nothing is impossible. And it, I'm going to expect you to sing it with me, okay? So... <laughs> it's Alipo Yezu Yote Yana Wezekana Alipo Yezu Yana Wezekana And then the chorus is just Yana Wezekana Yana Wezekana Alipo Yezu Yana Wezekana You repeat it. And in Africa they do a call and response thing, but we'll just be doing good to sing it, okay? Now if you want if you want any point you want to stand up and yell it out to God and and just proclaim it as, over a situation in your life and just sing it out. We all have impossible situations in our life and God ordains them so we can find out how powerful He is, how much we can depend on Him. So Alipo an amazing experience to be singing that with a bunch of moms from the slum that are completely destitute and uh, this my clicker thing and many have turned to prostitution or um, producing illegal, illegal liquor in their homes 
just to feed themselves, pay their rent, you know, and to give them hope and give them the gospel of Christ and then to see them stand up with me and sing it with all their hearts. It just breaks your heart. It's like Jesus really is all they have. There's, there's, hi, Ellen. <laughs> there's only hope. You know, it's their only hope. And it's so, it's easy for us to, in America, we have so much material things around us and so much relative security. It's so easy for us to not lean on Jesus. You know? And, and they're just such a reminder that Jesus is powerful and he's real. And his hope is something that's secure that you can stand on. So we named this trip. Um, can you help me, Steve? I don't know how to... Um, the gray ring? Okay. All right, now, I hope this is working. Yes, okay. Okay, um, we ca I called this <laughs> the impossible journey. We encountered so many obstacles. This year we, we went in December instead of, um, we normally travel, this is my husband Bob, we normally travel in uh, January through April, about four months a year. And this year we decided for different reasons to, to leave in December. Um, our ministry is called Africa Connect. We began in 2004 when God just supernaturally kind of picked us up and plopped us in Kenya uh, through a meeting with Pastor Peter Shiakama, which many of you know. He's been here speaking. And in that 10 years, we had watched God do the impossible and meet um, all the vision that he gave my husband back then is coming to pass, and we're just watching him do it. It's absolutely amazing to be involved in this. So we work in the, um, I'm just going to quickly go over this because most of you know the background of this ministry, but just in case. Um, this is a slum called Tuwani. It's a huge slum. I don't know how many people live there, maybe 60,000. If you include other areas that they're now calling Tuwani, it would be um, more like 100,000. It's just a maze of, of mud huts. It was, um, when we went, it was too dangerous for us to walk through. They said, you can't go in there. No white people have ever gone. And in 2006, we decided, heck with it, we're going, and got some big Kenyan men to go with us. And, and we walked through. We did a prayer walk through. And I have to tell you, God gave us a vision for a community transformation of that community through the power of God and we're watching it happen. It's a different place today. And we walk through and there's gardens and it's still a mess. There's so much to do, it, it's impossible. It's still impossible, but we're watching God do it. It's happening. Um, it's, it's northwest of Nairobi, about eight hour drive. It's in the rural farmlands. There's actually a town called Katali nearby. And, um, for the role, what happens is all these people come from, because of HIV and the breakdown in the family and people losing their land, uh, tribal wars. Tawani is basically a refugee camp that's become established. Um, that's mostly women. Most of the men come and make babies and leave again. And there, it's just, it's really the, the center of prostitution in that area. And these women used to have families and homes and farms. They're just desperate. This is where we stay, a compound called Karabuni Lodge. And it's very safe. It's, uh, we can't stay in the slum, but we ha we're fortunate to have a great place to stay with good food. And we have a kitchen, and that's an open kitchen in the middle. There's two rooms there. And when we have teams, they, one of, some of them stay in the other side of the cabin. And we actually were there for I don't know if you can see it, but we brought our Christmas lights and cut a tree and we had Christmas over there and it was awesome. We missed our kids and our family, but it's so beautiful to have a simple Christmas. It was just about Jesus. It was great. Um, this, something that's unique about Africa Connect is we work with in partnership with indigenous people. Um, 
many, most missionary organizations, what they do is they're, because they're denominational, they set up, they have a particular structure they go by, and so the missionaries have to abide by that structure. So they're forcing, they, they go over and they hire Kenyans basically to do the work in their project, mm -hmm. and which is great, and thank God for all the work that's happened that way. But God gave us a vision for to partner with Kenyans in a body of Christ model. And it's taken many years to, to work out the trust and the relational issues. But Africa is really relational. It's all about relationships. So it's been worth the work and it's been a lot of work and mistakes and everything. And now we have a team. We are so one. We're members of the church over there and they call us leaders and ask us to speak sometimes, but we're just church members. We aren't the famous white people that come in. We're just, and that's what we always desired. And we work together and we're fortunate because um, this church is really unusual. In, in Kenya, 80% of the pastors, I, we can safely say, are corrupt. And that's, it's a job, it's a way they can make money. And they learn how to make a lot of money off of poor people. And a lot of the young people have left the church because of this. And, but Graceway is extremely founded on the Word. They're very devoted to the Word of God. Uh, Spirit-filled. They have an incredible love and compassion for their community. And over the years, we've seen that take root. And they've realized their vision is, is to reach Tuani. And, and they're the ones doing the work all year long. We go over there, but they're, they're the heroes. They're amazing people. Pastor Peter there at the pulpit, that's his little boy, Justin, uh, testing out the microphone. And our, this, our, on the stage is worship team. Uh, our social worker and cook are on the worship team. Uh, all of our staff almost goes to the church. They're all spirit-filled, beautiful Christians. Um, up in the top right corner is Apollo. He's the pastor of Graceway now, and he is one of the most men full of integrity and courage and strength that I've ever known. He's really a unique guy. And he works full time and he pastors and he plants churches and he's an animal for the Lord. It's amazing. And his wife Rose is the secretary of the church and she runs our empowerment programs. And the bottom right is our team that came over. We had um, six people besides us come over for the month of February led by our son-in-law, Caleb. It was the first time he led a team and he did an awesome job. And these people were from five different churches in all over America, California, New York State. This is crazy what God's doing. Huh? It was a lot of fun. Well, you gotta point that down a little back. What? Point out, uh, point out the, well. Oh, I will. In the back, oh, behind them is Fred. Can you, I don't know if you can see him, his little fat head there. He's, he's, <laughs> sorry, Fred. He would laugh if I said that, but. <laughs> he, he is a very key figure in our life now, and I'll explain that as we go. Uh, this is the core of our project. God gave us a vision um, to start with the kids and stay with the kids, and everything would go out of that. Um, the kids are precious to Jesus Christ. And these kids are taken from some of the most desperate situations we can find in Tuani, which is pretty bad. Um, they are 90 children every year in three different grades, baby class, mid class, top class. Um, we've, they come in, the bottom left picture is when we first met them at the beginning of the year and they're like, wow, who are these people? They're white, what is, you know? And they come in, these kids are abused, they're malnourished, they're sick. And within a month, you wouldn't believe the difference. We feed them, we give them medical care, regular clinics. Um, the, it's just astounding, the difference. Oh. <laughs> I just want to play this for you. Sorry. So you can meet them. I don't know how to do this. Maybe not. 
Oh, I have a video of them singing, and it's so cool, but I don't know how to do that without messing everything up. Okay, our staff is all um, amazingly poured out. They, they work for less than the standard pay because that's all we can do. And they work long hours. After, after school, they'll go into the slum and visit the moms. They're part of the outreach. They're all trained and to do cell groups. And they're, they're really incredible instruments of the Lord. They really love these children. Uh, the top left corner is our social worker, Wycliffe. He's in training, but he is doing an amazing job. He's poured out for these kids. And the bottom left is our cooks. They are the, the best evangelists in the church. They go into the slum and they just rock. It's amazing. We're very proud of them. Um, this is... I'm sorry. Okay, Uniform Day is one of the biggest days of our year. We do it when the team is there so they can take part. We take these scruffy little kids and, and uh, the tailoring class helps make the uniforms. All kids in Kenya have uniforms or they, are, you know, they don't rate. So we strip them down and we wash them down and, and we put their new clothes on them and we buy them backpacks and, and leather shoes and they, it's such a big deal to them. They're like, you know, that verse where I will raise them up out of the ash heap and make them princes to sit with princes. And that's what you get to see in one day. It's incredible. And it's a high point for our team. Our little baby class. <laughs> so we aren't content to leave it at that. We, we didn't want to do primary, but uh, the death of one of our kids at primary age, um, the Lord used that to, to prompt us to start our own sponsor fund, um, just by faith. Uh, so the Ian Memorial Scholarship Fund, um, we now have 35 kids that we placed in good private um, Christian schools and these are kids that just could not go to school the reason we have a free preschool is because you have to pay to go to preschool over there and if you don't go to preschool you can't get into primary so these poorest kids are shut out and they are stuck basically in the cycle of poverty forever it's just hopeless they end up they end up street kids or dead um, many of these kids would be dead if it weren't for this program. So we love these kids. We've known them since they were um, three, four years old, most of them. And uh, most of them, 25 of them, are in Seat of Hope, a nearby school. So for only $300 per year, you can sponsor a child, and that's everything. That's transport, safe transport, and uniform shoes, and their school fees, and a meal at school. A lot of them, it's the only meal they get is when they eat at school. This is uh, Caleb. And, uh, you know, we, went, we go and visit the homes of the sponsored kids, as many as we can. And the social worker visits all of them. But, but we like to keep track ourselves. And uh, our team went with us. And these two were lucky enough to meet their sponsored child. It's pretty amazing. <coughs> Lil, yeah, Lil is actually um, our son-in-law, uh, JJ's mother. So we're kind of related. <laughs> it was really fun having her there. She wants to go back. No, wild horses couldn't keep her from going back. And this is one of our girls. I'm going to tell you a story. And this is one of my favorite stories. I'll try not to cry. But Jane, we've known Jane since she was three. And she was always really special girl. It was just one of those, like, had this light on her and coming out of her. And, and like, when she performed or danced, you know, it's like all eyes go on her. She just has this presence about her. And very smart and very sweet and just this amazing girl. And a few years ago, she started having problems and her temperament changed unexpectedly. She got really depressed and went wrong. And I was trying to find out what happened to Jane. I show up in Kenya and she's a different kid. So we went to her home and found out that um, the father, father-in-law was beating the mom. And, um, and also that he had raped her older sister. 
and it was splitting the family apart. She went to live with her mother, grandmother in Bidi to get out of the house because of the violence. And um, so I tried to get her mom, Emily, to come to tailoring class to change her situation so she didn't feel dependent on this man. And she ended up, you know, when all of our kids, we decided to do the sponsor program and we had to really quick raise a lot of sponsors to get them in the Seat of Hope. Um, it was an emergency move. And Jane, like we found a sponsor for Jane and we couldn't find her. We didn't know what happened to her. And our whole church was praying for Jane. Where is she? Because the day was closing that she could get into school. And Wycliffe was, and she lived in Bedi, which is really far. It's like another whole community. And I never even go there. And how are we going to find her in this huge expanse? And that week we were praying. Wycliffe, our social worker, was walking through Tuwani, a whole different area, and ran into her mom and found out where they lived and was able to get her in the last day before the school closed its doors. And that's the story of Jane. She's always on the edge. You know, she's always just making it, and just like rescued by God. And this year, I got a phone call from the Seat of Hope social worker. And he said, I need to talk to you about Jane. Please come. And we had another team thing scheduled. I was like, I jumped on a Peaky Peaky, which is a motorcycle taxi. I went to Seat of Hope. And I said, what's up? He said, Jane's missing a lot of school. I'm really worried about her because where she lives is so far from the bus and it's really dangerous for her to walk to the bus and we knew that was an issue and we didn't know what to do about it you know but it had become a, a crisis point where Jane was living in fear to go to school um, he said we can we're willing to board her at Seat of Hope we have an opening and we'll take her and the money you're spending for transport will put toward her living so it won't cost any more just you know but you are her sponsor so you have to go to the home and get permission from the mom so I called Wycliffe I said right now Wycliffe we gotta we gotta go to Bidi and got a taxi drove to Bidi and we found the grandmother's home I'd never been there it was a, it was a brewer's den and there were all these all these men walking in and out it was and little kids and these drunk men all over the place and the grandmother was just like incapable of holding it together and I'm just sitting there and then they said oh Jane's mom moved where did she move to they said Osokomoko and I saw Wycliffe just go oh. I said, what he says Sokomoko is worse than Bidi it is the pit like it, everybody there brews changa everybody's drunk rape is really high it's really a horrible place and it's far. And just then, we didn't even know, they couldn't tell us where the house was. So it's like, we gotta find Jane and get her out of there. And just then a, a young lady walked in and it was Jane's aunt. And she said, oh, I'll take you. She jumped in the car. We went, it's getting dark. You don't wanna be there after dark. There's no cell service. It's like, you know. So we go and we find the home and there's Emily. And living in this pit with her older sister and another little girl. I um, actually have a picture. And this is the home of the grandmother, the bottom left. And Wycliffe, I was just like, let's get out of here and go. And he was like, wait a minute. And he started preaching to these guys. And I watched them. It was like, they are going to listen. And God just blew my mind. Like I watched their countenances change as they heard the gospel of grace. And they, and they responded and they all got saved and they were broken. And I was like, okay, okay, you know. And this is Wycliffe on the right with them. And he follows up with them. He visits these guys and he's discipling them. And the top right is Emily and um, Centrine and Marion. Jane's family. I talked to Emily and she agreed to sign and she said actually Jane's been crying every night to be able to go to, to live at Seat of Hope and there was just a child raped there just this week on that road. The road she had to walk by was was in front of a forest where all the thieves and 
and gangs hang out. And every day she was risking her, her life, you know, to walk to school. And so we were able to get that signature and we called the headmaster and said, don't send her home, she's not doing that one more day. Keep her there. And then the next, the next time I got to go to Seed of Hope, a couple days later, I told Jane, I said, your mom signed, you're here, and you stand here. And she just, she literally just crumbled and wrapped her arms around my waist and held on for 10 minutes and just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. It was just like she, she knew she, it was right around the corner, you know? And I just saw at that moment, it's like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I, this, I just want to rescue kids, you know? So thank God for Jane. She's doing great. So the key outreach that we do is home visits into the home. You know, these, these uh, the, if you can help the kids, but if you don't transform the family, it's not going to do it that much good long term. So our goal is to get the family and then the family affects the community. When the community starts seeing change in families, it's contagious. And and so we go we follow the kids into the home and evangelize. They're very open to the gospel. They know they need Jesus. And this is Wycliffe, another Wycliffe that Bob led to the Lord in a home, the bottom left. Top right is Zipporah and her kids. This is a few years ago when she had hit the bottom of desperation. She had no food. She had nothing. She was, you know, living in prostitution and desperate. And I, my heart was just, I prayed for Zipporah all the time. And this year I went back and they said, oh, Zipporah started a business. She has a, like a legit business now and she's coming to church regularly. And I went, I saw her and, and got to pray with her and for sure she, she knows the Lord and her life is totally different. And now her daughters moved back in with her because she's more of the stable one. You know, so that was pretty awesome. And the bottom right is uh, little John Magua and his grandmother. She's, um, I'd say a hopeless alcoholic except for the hope of Jesus. And he was being tortured. She was beating. She'd get drunk and she would take hot irons out of the fire and burn his legs. He'd come to school with huge burns and, and gashes and not eating. You should see this kid eat. He'll eat. Uh, the other kids give him their food because they know how hungry he is. And so we went to the home and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, <laughs> do something with this lady. But you know what? We talked to her and we prayed with her. I don't know if she's born again, but she stopped beating him. And, and her sister also is a guardian of one of our kids and she's living next door and she's watching over her. And she's coming to parent meetings, so we're, we're believing that there's progress there. So we didn't take him out of the home in this case. And then Silas and Rose, I'll try, I'll try to be brief with this, but this is an example of how we work with other ministries to rescue kids. Um, over the years, we've, met, we've been able to meet a lot of other missionaries and get to know them and find out you know, who's like-minded. And it's starting to pay off now and working together. Uh, Evelyn is with the crutch there. She, um, that was another case of abuse. She was brewing liquor and her kid wasn't coming to school, little Rose. And it was a, she was a mean drunk. And I was really angry. I was kind of mama bear going there. And I thought I was gonna go in and just figure out how to get the kid out of her house. We got there and Silas, her son was there. She wasn't there. And he had a tooth like this um, that hadn't been taken care of. He was in a lot of pain and he was very angry. And she wasn't there, so I was just like, let's call the chief and get these kids out of this home. And made a big circle around the salon, walking back, and Wycliffe says, oh, she's home. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna say to this lady, you know? And I went and I prayed, I went in, and God really taught me something. And he, like said, I want you to share Christ with her. And I watched her break. And I watched her, I talked to her about Jesus taking her shame. She doesn't have to carry it. And she broke. And she, and she received Christ. And I held her hand and prayed with her. And God broke me. 
And this is her at a new believers class in church. She has a, I didn't recognize her, her totally transformed face. And Silas wasn't in school. And we didn't know what to do with Silas. We don't have the money to put kids in school, you know, we didn't, he's not in our program and, you know. So I finally got a hold of Challenge Farm, another ministry there that deals with street kids. His brother was trying to get him on the street and he was, he was really already turning into a street kid, which they sniff glue and die young. And, and uh, the last day we left, I was literally getting on the plane and the lady from Challenge Farm said, we got him, we got a space for him. I got home, put it on Facebook and we got the money for a startup for him. And, and he's there and this is the, the, his, a couple hours after he got to Challenge Farm, you can see the difference. So um, these ladies get saved and they need another way to live and we're teaching them to rise up themselves. We don't give handouts. So we have empowerment programs. We have tailoring. We have two tailoring classes um, that are a year-long course, a professional course. And the other women that are graduating are getting on their feet and coming back and telling the other parents about it. We also have small business now, um, instructing them how to run a business, how to manage accounts and budgets. And this is the women responding in the parents' meeting when we said, how many would take part in a small business class? <laughs> they are ready. It's taken years for them to get it through their head. We're not going to give them money. They have to do this. And they're ready. So we need to meet them where they're at. And this um, on the bottom left is the back of the Graceway Church. Today, Graceway had a fundraiser they called the Grand Love Offering. For the past year, the people of Graceway have decided they're going to renovate their church themselves. They don't want money from the West. They're doing it themselves. And these are poor people. And every Sunday, they do a big deal and take a special offering. And the Sunday school kids come out and put 50 shillings in it, you know. And they have raised $6,000 in about eight months. It's impossible. It's a lot of money. They are so proud. And today was their final big love offering where they invite everybody and all the dignitaries and try to get, they need a million shillings and they have, I think, 700,000. Yeah. And so what we're doing is, is our part is we want to build those, where those pillars are, four rooms. We start with two rooms, one for the empowerment. We need our own room for our empowerment. We're renting right now and it's not adequate. And we need a place for storage. We don't have a, a safe storage for our bulk food and for our office. So we're fundraising for that right now. Um, and real quick, I'll run through the other outreach. Um, this is our Christmas distribution, uh, our most effective recent outreach to the community. We, we gave them money to have a Christmas dinner. It's a big deal to them. Their Christmas, if it was good or bad, means what did you eat for Christmas? And so we invited them all. They all came and more. And we had exactly the packages down to the person. And then the church gathered up all their clothes and their shoes. And they donated and had a big pile of clothes. And they all walked away with a Christmas dinner and a dress or a pair of shoes. And uh, we fed the kids and gave them biscuits. And, and um, that picture was Pastor Peter praying with 10 of the moms. They got saved that day. And uh, yeah. Then outreach medical clinics in February. We have a, a team come over. And Sue Choquette is our medical director. We do outreaches into the rural villages where there's literally no medical care. And she, um, she's been doing this for four years, coming over and doing this. And now she has a strong Kenyan team of doctors that work with her and just wait for her to come back. But these are all, all satellite churches of gospel light. So we know the pastor. We know they're going to get followed up. And they serve about 300, 250 to 300 people a day. So as they come in, we are, we are preaching to the crowd as they come and go all day long. And so many get saved. Um, this is Lil giving health instruction. The team just helps out wherever they can. Caleb doing wound care, and the others helping with, with the health brochures or any way they can. 
and lives are saved. You can't imagine people that have no place to go when they're sick. They have nothing. And these, these clinics cost up to it's like 600, 650 per clinic now. So if anyone has a heart for that, you can donate just specifically to fund these clinics. Okay. Um, it's amazing to be able to preach to, to the unreached. And there's a lot of areas in Kenya still that are unreached. Um, at the clinics, we, we see people who never heard the gospel. We do the Jesus film uh, with our partners around Kenya. And we do it in the native language. And so many people get saved. I mean, there was a thousand people raise their hands, receive Christ in three showings just around Christmas. Yeah, it's really powerful. And Caleb's just starting to preach. Caleb's starting to preach, yeah. <laughs> And this is Sokomoko, where uh, Graceway wants to do three church plants in the rest of the year. And Sokomoko is the place I found Jane, and it means a place where funny things happen. And we're looking for that name to change, because, you know, the area that where Graceway Church is was called Matecha, and that means a place where nothing can grow. It's all done. The ground can't produce anymore. And the local officials last November came to the preschool graduation and officially announced that the county government has changed the name of that neighborhood to Graceway in recognition of the change that the church and preschool has made in that community. So Peter called us up and told us on the phone and we cried. <laughs> God is faithful. These are three drunk ladies that I was able to lead to the Lord and they came to church. They walked five miles to church the next day. So they're planting a church in Sokomoko. Um, and in Pocot, it's an amazing unreached territory. Apollo is planning an outreach and leadership training. Um, we're hoping to be able to go to that. Bob went up there with him to scout out the land. So we have a lot going on. And, uh, you know, we have a small donor base and a small team. And we can't just keep draining the same people, you know. But what we need is, is partners here. We need people that, that catch a vision for this and are willing to do a fundraiser for something. You know, like, like you can be an active part of the field over there in a, in a practical way. You know, the church could send someone over if you want. You know, it, like we want to work with the body here. We don't want this just to be, you give us money, we'll go. This is all of us together as a body. You know, and there's so much we can do together. But we need people that, that will catch a vision and spread the word and, and just grab a hold of something, okay, and help us out. So thank you so much for everything you've done. We love you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm actually af as afraid of microphones. <laughs> My personnel is going to change. Uh, 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 just, just the honor of the word of God. And so shall my word be that goes forth out of thy mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereinto I sent it. Um, the word of God is the word of God. Um, Oh, can't find the other one. So, we'll just leave it. Uh, never mind. But there are so many verses on the poor. I just try to keep it simple because I just go through the Bible every day and I read like four chapters a day and I try to lead at least that and there's just so much I, it's just so simple all you got to do is read something about the poor and there's you know I just had a whole bunch of verses but I'm not going to read them just what I just read yesterday so I all I'm doing is saying hi and, and thank you for uh, your part Pastor Nelson and, and the church here for your part your prayers and uh for, for the field. And as you know, your integration with the field is a blessing on the church. We represent, you send us out, you pray for us, we're here to serve the church, the church doesn't serve us. So 
you send us out and your part, your prayers on the field and your support uh, is your, as, as you know, that is your blessing. Because that's God blessing the church because he has to, re, he has to reward uh, the Great Commission. He has to reward uh, the, the day of Pentecost, those people that went out, you know. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's a sacrifice. It costs some time. It costs some money. It costs this. It costs that. But that sacrifice, um, chalk it up to eternal. Because if, if, if we're making God happy and we can all get there and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, <laughs> that, that, that's amazing. I, I can't imagine God looking at me and telling me that. I'm, I must like, keep your hat, you know, keep your hat. like, you're kidding, right? All I'm doing is receiving, you know. And nothing's based on, oh, we're doing so good, so that means we're great Christians. It's, it's all mercy, you know. It's the mercy of God that we could be there. It's his kindness, his goodness. It's the mercy of God we can be here. None of us are a big deal, you know. We just breathe in and breathe out what God gives us to breathe. <laughs> and he rewards us for that. Okay, we'll take it. I don't mind introducing, did you introduce Bob? I mean, introduce, uh, our friend Bob Britton. We go back uh, many years. His children play with my children when they were children. And, and uh, so we go way back. And he's been a very much a part of our lives. He's part of African Connect. He comes to all the meetings and has a lot of wisdom, Bob does. And, and, uh, and we really appreciate his part in our life. And, and Keith Roll over here, he was uh, some of you that were involved in Keswick. He was one of the leaders up at Keswick. And it's actually Keswick where the whole vision was hatched um, 10 years ago, more. But uh, with uh, Dan Keogh, who has managed Keswick Camp. And we were going to begin a Bible college, Bible school, world outreach school at Keswick uh, involving the Berkshire community and other places. And, for, for training people for the field, uh, for the you know, science of gardening and solar energy and you know, on and on and on. You know, the things that are needed in the third world. We wanted to do that at Keswick. And it, it changed ownerships and everything, but as Dan said years ago, he reminded me the other day. He says, it, this is the greatest piece of land you know, in the Berkshires. It's a beautiful piece of land. But if we don't get this piece of land to do this, he could do it anywhere. Well, we didn't know. He did it, started doing the next year in the slum of Kenya. That was <laughs> God's choice. And we have, uh, uh, what wasn't mentioned is uh, an opportunity for Bible college right now. We're doing Bible schools. And, oh, hi, Ellen. I haven't seen you for a while. Hello. <laughs> we, um, um, we have this opportunity, we've, the, the, our connections, connect is a very good term. Our connections with the body, with other Christians is, is what we survive on. And this Dr. Kasang, I would love, I, I would love him to come here and talk to you. This guy, he's almost 80. And he's really, what a brother he is. He founded the Cherangani Hospital, which is probably the only good hospital in the entire region. They pray over people in the morning, but they started in the lawn. People had this dangerous malaria in 1994 in front of mud huts with quinine water because they couldn't, they couldn't even find the medication. Many children were dying. There was a lot of death, a lot of, and that's how a Cherangani started with $400 US. But the connections, our friend Warner Mischke, who is now head of Mission One, which is a worldwide ministry, He's connected somehow through this back door with Dr. Kasang and what he's doing. And then we meet over there. And it's like all these connections are happening in the church. And, and uh, it's, it's just uh, and, and that's, that's the way we survive. And, and uh, so I, I, don't, I don't have anything much else to say except uh, uh, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for receiving us. And uh, looking forward to having lunch with you all. Um, there, there will be a time. Um, uh, I don't know if it'll be here or where it'll be, but we want you to meet more of the team. Everybody, we want, and instead of us doing the presentation, uh, team members, other other team members uh, throughout the region, uh, just give them like short little 
stories and everything, what they do. Well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We have to give Bob a lot of grace because the last time he was here, we didn't have this technology. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what you are seeing through Africa Connect is the Great Commission, which is what the day of Pentecost was all about. Preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, then in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Our Jerusalem is here in Otis. We preach the gospel here in Otis. We have Bible studies here in Otis. I do Bible studies in Russell and, in, and sometimes informal ones in Westfield. That's our Judea. I haven't quite figured out what our Samaria is. Maybe that's Pittsfield or Springfield and we need, probably need to work on that a little bit. But Africa Connect is the uttermost part of the earth for us. And we, and we are so glad to partner with them. And we don't mind pouring our money into Africa Connect. Because you see that people are being fed physically and they're being saved and fed spiritually as well. And notice they're not giving out handouts. Socialism is not the answer. Giving someone a handout doesn't bless them. It's only a temporary fix. They are teaching them to work. Isn't it funny how Christianity and capitalism tend to go hand in hand? And yet our president would tell us we need to give more to the poor. No, what we need to do is we need to teach the poor to be self-sufficient. Because the Bible says, if a man does not work, he shall not eat. And I'm not against people who are sick and can't work. People who have issues. We, we take care of them. That's, I'm all for that. But what we are doing in our country is going to lead to poverty like there is in Kenya. Because we're teaching our people not to depend on God and not to do their own part. And the whole point of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost was to empower God's people. Paul, one of the greatest missionaries, who wasn't there on the day of Pentecost per se, maybe. We don't know for sure. He worked a job and preached the gospel. But he had the Holy Spirit's power to do so. And we read earlier those two passages. In Acts chapter 1, it said that Christ presented infallible proofs to his disciples for 40 days. Christianity does not ask you, Jesus does not ask you to put your brain in neutral and not think. You are given many proofs. You are given the word of God to study to show yourself approved and to activate that brain that God gave you and to, and to teach and learn and receive the truth. But it's not just your brain, your effort, the truth of God being poured into you. It is also the Holy Spirit. We need both. And when we worship, we worship what? In spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worshipers that the Father desires. And that's why we here encourage you to be open to the gifts of the Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit come upon you, to empower you, to equip you, to prepare you, to convict you, to show you what to do. But we also want to give you God's Word because God's Word, like our brother read, will not return void. It will accomplish what it sets out to do. And it was God's Word that led the people the Israeli people, to the day of Pentecost. It was God's word that led to the Gentile Pentecost. And it is God's word going throughout the world under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit that will reap a harvest. And the church of Jesus Christ is being built to this very day. We pray a prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is God's will. That people be saved and that they be, that they be saved in all facets of their life. Spiritually, may you, Paul says, may you be sanctified completely and holy in your spirit, soul, and body. God wants you to be saved, born again. He wants you 
to use your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions to study God's word and to be a part of and allow the Holy Spirit to direct that. But he also wants to take care of the physical part of us. Because what, what kind of effect would Africa Connect have if they went into these slums and just preached the gospel and never tried to help their physical needs? What good would that be? How, how would they listen? Maybe, many, some would, because God's spirit is powerful, God's word is powerful. But look at how what God is doing, those, those bright smiles, those kids wearing those brand spanking new uniforms. That's awesome. And that is a testimony to the glory. Because my understanding, it's a Muslim-dominated country, isn't it? Small percentage, but they, they gave them high posts. For okay, well, they're beginning to t take control of the country yeah. and stuff. Islam does not do that. Yeah, no. Islam kills. Christianity brings people no to the atheists. author of life. There are no atheist orphanages. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And, and what we want to do is twofold things, because we want to put feet to our, our faith and our belief. First, I would like for us to take up an offering, a love offering for Africa Connect. And don't, don't be sad. We want to do this. We want to bless and prosper this. We want to put our money where our mouth is. Okay? Because our money represents our life. We work hard at jobs to earn money. Why? So we can live easy and, you know, be, you know, fat, rich Americans? No. At least I don't. I earn my money to build the kingdom of God. And, and the cool thing is, God lets me enjoy some of that money as well. But that is not the primary goal. At least it shouldn't be. So if I could have Stephen Chip come forward, and we're going to take up a love offering. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus, accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week. And may God bless you all the days of your life.